I like how you said enjoy the show. Yeah. Like it, it's not one of those that you have to buy a ticket for. We're in Vegas. Like that. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's Vegas. This is, this is Vegas. Um, so we're so glad you're here with us. We know that since these are box lunches, you couldn't possibly be here for the food. So it must be, it must be the company and that you thought it was going to be a great show. It's the title and of the program. I was just, isn't this a great <laughs> title? And, and of course, what we ask ourselves is, how come we hadn't thought of that already, right? This is like the, this is the cutest title. Maria thought of it, just so no, you know. No, I wish, I wish I, would, I, I don't take credit for that. Um, but as he said, I'm Maria Breu. I'm at the University of Miami when I'm not in Vegas. And I'm joined by two really great friends who also happens to be, happen to be rock stars in the world of IBD that need no introduction, but Jessica Allegretti, who is at, the, at Brigham and Women's Hospital and head of IBD, but really famous because she was a medical student at the University of Miami. That is my claim to fame. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yes. <laughs> the very first medical student I worked with when I got to the University of Miami, and I knew then, I really did know then, that she was going to run the world. And then David Rubin, who is the head of GI at the University of Chicago and, of course, has made uh, incredible contributions to our field. I was not your medical student. We're, to your dismay. Ever? <laughs> I'm your student. I was not your medical student. <laughs> so we have, you know, I, I see that the, the audience isn't so big, so there's a little bit of intimacy. Um, and, of course, you have the iPads. Presumably, there's this wider world of people that are watching and that might be sending us questions. Um, we want to, we're sitting down, so it just it automatically means that if we're sitting that it's gonna be informal, because how formal could you be if you're like, you know, sitting? Um, especially since um, Jessica and I can't touch the floor with our feet because we're, <laughs> we're, we're cut from the same short cloth. All right, so we're gonna get started. Uh, yep, you know who's supporting us. You can choose to follow them on Twitter. All right, this is me. This is Jessica. This is David Rubin. And these are our learning objectives, which you have, okay? So um, what I like about this particular slide is I'll make a couple of points on this slide. One, notice there's this big chunk of a gap between 1998 and 2014 when something new was on the horizon. And what's cool about the, the way that this slide has been designed is it not just tells you about which agents were added when, but which classes and mechanisms of action, right? If you had come to a lecture a lunchtime symposium uh, anytime in between those years, 98 to 2014, I don't know, you were alive? Okay. I was alive. Um, <laughs> you would know that we would be kind of splitting hairs, like which anti-TNF is better, which is the dose, you know, how did we, how did we modify dosing? That, that would be kind of what we would be splitting hairs about, right? Now we're on to, we have all these different mechanisms of action. You'll go to multiple lectures uh, about when to use what, you know, how to sequence these different things, and do we understand enough of the biology to, to, um, to talk about these. But clearly what you can see, and what, the, of course, the theme of the program is going to be is, a, is on an interleukin-23, that like, in a sense, the, the era of anti-TNF where, wow, you hit pay dirt when you, when you started inhibiting TNF, we're on a similar era as with respect to inhibiting interleukin-23. Um, we choose medicines based on a lot of things. Um, this, this next hour and change is gonna be a lot about interleukin-23 with a focus on that. But of course we know that we have these different mechanisms of action and some of the things that go through our brain when we're with individual patients is how sick is that person? How quickly do we need something to act? Do we have a history where they've just been through a lot of different medications and, not, 
and something, how many patients come to you and say, something always works at the beginning, but then it loses its mojo, and I, I'm, I'm always afraid that I'll have to go on to something else. And I find that fascinating, that there are these phenotypes where people really are kind of repeat offenders. They lose, they, they become refractory to a mechanism, and their immune system figures out a different way to, to continue this onslaught of inflammation. We heard a brilliant lecture, of course, this morning by my mentor, Steph Targan, um, who is really the, the person who got me into IBD in the, in the first place. And so in a way, that's how Jessica, Jessica is, in a sense, a granddaughter of, mm -hmm. of, that, of, that, of that tribe, um, that really trying to see, can, can we do better functional genetics and genomics? And could that edify uh, what choice of therapies we're going to use in different patients? Patients are, of course, always worried about safety, although we, li we list infection first because we're talking to a medical audience. If this was a lay audience, really people are only worried about getting cancer. They're only worried about getting cancer, right? I don't know, again, I'm looking to see you're all chewing, but that um, in reality, that's the first question people have, not is there an increased risk of infection? Because the reason that we've done so well in microbiology and, and uh, in antibiotics that we could um, and not have to worry about that. All right, so we, we, we try right now, largely we're making decisions on clinical grounds. I won't sort of put a damper on the lunch and say on insurance grounds, but we're making these decisions not necessarily in the way that we wish that we could make them. And again, to draw on something that Steph said that I can again say to you, but I don't necessarily say to patients, is because oncology is much simpler, and yes, I did say that, it is much simpler. You have you have a monoclonal population that's proliferated with certain mutations, and they, these mutations drive proliferation. And if you could find which pathway is that is activated or mutated, you could target that. This isn't at all that simple, right? You, you've gleaned that already from um, the talks that you've been to at this meeting. So um, in terms of IBD pathogenesis, again, I alluded to the fact that it's not simple, because it's, it's multifactorial, all the, the, the events that need to um, come together in order for an individual to develop what we, what we say, oh, you have IBD, you have Crohn's, you have ulcerative colitis. And one of the big revolutions has to do with the genetics of IBD, um, that even, even though initially it wasn't as well invested in as looking for the genetics of type 1 diabetes, for example. There was this revolution that occurred in understanding the complex genetics of IBD and, and, and um, incorporating into that knowledge all this new technology, like the ability to sequence the human genome, right? And once that people started sequencing the human genome or doing chip-based um, analyses where they can look very quickly at the differences between a pe person with Crohn's disease and a person that did not have Crohn's disease, um, one of the earliest hits using these strategies was um, polymorphisms in the IL-23 receptor. I chose my words carefully. Polymorphism just means that it's, a, it's an area that we're different, in, you know, genetically different between people. It's not a mutation. People that have these polymorphisms are normal. We have them in this audience. We, we have, we're all a composite of all these different polymorphisms. And, in the, and, and with respect to IL-23, which is the subject of our, of our conversation today, uh, polymorphisms in the receptor change the susceptibility to IBD. This slide is featuring those initial observations, which is that some polymorphisms are protective from developing IBD, protective. And actually, we're studying whether or not this is true across all populations, actually, uh, whether people that are of Amerindian, i.e., from Latin America and you know, the Indians of Latin America, those genes, whether this, this gene is as relevant in those populations as it is in European populations, or is it relevant in those populations because they've been mixed up with Europeans and on, that, on their chromosome, that little piece is coming from Europe and those polymorphisms are coming from Europe. So there's a lot of, I think, richness that we still have to discover about the genetic regulation of IBD in, a, in an ancestral contextual way. So, so I'm building up a story, in case you can't tell, about why IL-23 turned out to be like something that we already had like an imagination that this was going to be important in, in IBD. The genetics was telling us that, right? That if you had certain things that protect, that these receptors could protect or, or increase the risk of developing IBD. So, you know, so why target um, IL-23? Well, it turns out that IL-23 is very important at mucosal interfaces, right? 
we're, we here uh, are interested in that interface in the gut, right, in, in the gut. And so IL-23 is an important mechanism that we have to protect us against pathogens and pathogenic, because the entire gut immune system is not built around, let's develop IBD so people can go to a meeting in Vegas. It's built around um, the ability to fight off pathogens in the event that the box lunch doesn't turn out to be, you know, all that it was intended to be. No, I'm sure it's, it's absolutely fine. I'm sure it's been radiated and has nothing that's really real in it anyway so that it's not gonna, it's not gonna have any pathogens. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. So um, IL-23 um, uh, has, you know, in a sense, it was an interesting choice because on the one hand, IL-23, we need some of it, right, to be protective. And in particular, we need certain, like, TH17, uh, pathway stuff to protect that mucosal barrier. And we know from uh, the human experiment where people were given an anti-IL-17 antibody to treat Crohn's disease that in fact placebo in that case did better than the, the drug, that people actually worsened when they received it. Conversely, if you haven't watched the ads, the non-Crohn's ads or the non-UC ads on, on television, there are a lot of ads for anti-IL-17 directed therapies for people who have psoriasis and other conditions where it's amazing, where anti-IL-17 turns out to be amazing. So there are these subtle differences between what happens in the gut because of, and, and that interface of having one epithelial cell layer keeping us from, from the outer world uh, or from that inner world and say skin and other conditions. This shows it diagrammatically here that in a sense what I'm saying is you need this IL-17 protective effect but then things could really, like everything, that pendulum, you know, it's got to be that sweet spot, right? That sweet spot of biology where too little is bad and too much is bad. Okay. Um, this shows it in a slightly different way just to make the point that uh, we start with T cells that are naive, that don't know like what they're going to grow up to be. In the context of the cytokines that are in their, in their and the interaction with other cells, like antigen presenting cells, they may go on to become these Th17 cells. Um, actually, I heard an absolutely brilliant talk uh, in the microbiome and health and, and IBD section, like in, in the last session. And so these, this this requires actually the presence of bacteria for this uh, to occur. And so these, these Th17 cells could be like the ones that we need to protect our barrier, to keep the bacteria that are kind of constantly, uh, constantly on that surface from you know, attacking us. On the other hand, if there's interleukin-23, we come back to IL-23 in the environment of that, uh, of that T cell, that cell, instead of just being homeostatic, could go on to develop a lot of the cytokines that, you've, that you're you know, very familiar with, in the, even in the treatment and, and, the, and the pathogenesis of IBD, like TNF, like interferon gamma, and like IL-17. So this, is, this IL-23 and the levels of IL-23 locally turn out to be very important um, for the development of intestinal inflammation. And so um, I think this is a really cool video. Um, you can see the epithelial barrier on the top. Oh, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong uh, screen. But wait, don't wait for it. Yeah, there we go. Um, you can see this is meant to be a dendritic cell. It's busy in the mucosa secreting things like interleukin-23 and IL-1 and, and, and TNF. You can follow the color code. It's activating these T cells. Um, because again, in the presence of IL-23, these T cells are now busy making TH17 and making these pro-inflammatory cytokines that are damaging that epithelial barrier, causing apoptosis of cells and um, IBD. This is actually to corroborate that. This is an older study that looks at something easy to see, which is that you can easily see that IL-23 expression is elevated in patients with active IBD, again, corroborating that this is something being, being made locally in the gut that has implications for ongoing inflammation. Um, so this is a, a New England Journal of Medicine review article from a couple of years ago that I think is a really interesting concept. And so um, there are a lot of immune-mediated diseases, right? And we, and we, you know, we divide ourselves in the world of, of uh, medicine into you're, you're a rheumatologist or you're an ophthalmologist, you're a dermatologist, you're a gastroenterologist, and so we're organ system-based. But at an, at an immunological level, because again, 
in biology, you want to take advantage of things that seem to work, right? If you've got a good system going, you want to apply that system across a variety of things. You can see that if you've now looked at signature cytokines, that then things kind of segregate in a different way. And you can see that Crohn's and ulcerative colitis are driven by interleukin-23, and that there are other things like psoriatic arthritis and all that that also use IL-23 as a pathway. But I want to make an additional point on this, on this uh, slide, which is that you can see that in a sense, the final common pathway is TNF-alpha. And I use this as an example of the fact that we got a little bit spoiled in IBD because TNF is so central to so many different processes across immune-mediated diseases that that's why it fixed people's arthritis and why it fixed people's you know, uh, occasional psoriasis or ankylosing spondylitis. We don't have that luxury when we use something that's more targeted. On the flip side, when we use something that's more targeted, we might have the opportunity to have less of a bypass. Because once you've inhibited TNF, if you've got IBD occurring in people who are, who are already on an anti-TNF, good levels, you know, we can get into the details. That is a person that is going to be very hard to treat with many of these medications, and that's a recurring Achilles heel, to heel in our world, which is that TNF refractory, anti-TNF refractory patients are the hardest to treat. One of the early ways, um, am I talking too much? Do you guys have all. any, no, you're watching the question. I, I have a question for you. Okay. I knew you would. Asked. I knew you would. I've always thought that TNF was upstream and IL-23 is more downstream, but you've sort of made it sound like yeah. TNF comes later. Is I that think it does come later because I think that these pathogenic, <clears throat> TNF is, the source of TNF is multiple, right? Because actually probably, you know, monocytes, macrophages are making goobs and gobs of TNF. There's also probably very important TNF production by, by T cells. The other thing that is hard for us, and I think it's going to be more edified, and probably at some of the basic science talks at this meeting, single cell sequencing of human samples is going to be a big deal. Because in a lot of, our, a lot of research takes place in mice. And this is an area where mice are actually sufficiently different from humans that we don't know this. It's not so neat, the buckets of you're only a TH17 cell and you're a TH1 cell, because that's not the way biology works. So this, I think single cell sequencing might address that, but I think in certain, in certain instances, especially on the T cell side, probably IL-23 is upstream of that. May I ask one more? Of course. Well, so the, the role of, of um, IL-17 and yeah. the, the TH17 cells and yeah. the potential pro and anti-inflammatory functions, what about IL-12? I don't know. IL-12, it's an interesting, um, he's going to present the data on, you know, like the clinical data used to Kinemab and, you know, some of the IL-23 inhibitors. Um, IL-12 is very important for granuloma formation, right? Really important for granuloma for formation. What's amazing is I, I'll, I'll, uh, I will tell you that one of the remarkable things about this class of drugs is how safe it is. So obviously we really don't understand what's going on because how could you be inhibiting these pathways that you would think you're going to die of some awful infectious death, right, if you're inhibiting both interleukin-12 and interleukin-23. And lo and behold, there's the, the rate of infections is placebo, including for things that ha would, 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 would require a granuloma, right, like the tuberculosis and other things to, to be formed. So we're obviously missing something. And so um, why wouldn't it be that used to kinemab shouldn't be better than everything else if you're inhibiting both, or why shouldn't it be unsafe, but it's not. So I don't know that I have an easy answer, but maybe we'll get back to it in the context of the clinical data. And I was just gonna say, from one of our virtual okay. listeners, they wanna know from you, Maria, of the preclinical data that you've presented so far, and this may be a little premature because we're gonna get to some of this, but what's one of these developments that you think has the most likelihood to change practice? the most likelihood to change practice. Um, I mean, I haven't said it really, but I think, um, I, you know, again, I'm inspired a little by Steph's words. Um, I think one of the things that's most likely to change practice is having some simple test that we could categorize people and say, yeah, you're an IL-23 person, you're gonna respond. Um, my sense is, you know, we're seeing very high levels of efficacy with these drugs. My observation, and I really need for you guys to tell me if I'm crazy, 
is that with anti-TNF therapy, yes, you could find, and we could say there's a primary non-responder, like two people, right? Most of it is like a dose effect, right? That there's, there's at least some partial benefit, right? Like, you know, some people have a very, you know, very great effect and stuff. But with this mechanism, it's like when it works, it's magical. And when it doesn't work, you might as well have given them placebo. And we don't have the shades of, as many shades of gray as we did with, with anti-TNFs. This is notwithstanding, Jessica can tell you about her work with, you know, ustekinumab dosing, uh, excuse me, you know, and, and levels and sort of her beautiful work, and you, know, you can speak for yourself, that, that, that at least if you have a partial effect, yes, you can dose optimize, but if you've got bupkis, yeah. you probably, they're not a responder. Like, but, but remember, these are, you know, we spent a month getting the insurance to approve it. We spent another month getting them scheduled for an IV dose. These are not things that, these are, the person is six months or more down the line before we redirect what we're gonna do for them, right? You know, by the time we decide on this, you know, like, do they have mucosal healing? So there's this whole waste of money, time, energy, emotion for the patient by not having a better way of choosing whether the person is going to respond or not. So um, thank you, that virtual person. Okay, so this, back to this. One of the earliest things, you know, we, anti-TNF uh, was a little bit, you know, bedside to bench to bedside in that. Who knew it was going to be so amazing, right? When we were doing those initial studies of infliximab in people with you know, Crohn's disease and ultimately with ulcerative colitis, who knew? And one of the early mechanisms that was described to be an effect of the anti-TNF is that it would, in a sense, starve um, T cells of, of TNF and cause apoptosis of these T cells, OK? Um, and, and so this work from uh, Raja Atreya in, in, in um, in Germany has found that if, if there's IL-23 in the environment, it can then protect these T cells that would otherwise undergo apoptosis and the person would have a great response to anti-TNF. It protects these T cells, it causes these T cells to proliferate, make more of them, and it's a mechanism by which you have resistance to anti-TNF. So I wanna make that point that, again, IL-23 is this other link to having this negative impact on the efficacy of anti-TNF if you're that person, if you are that person. And it also sets Jessica up a little bit because she's going to talk to you about rational combination therapies and how do we pick, you know, if we, had, if we had all the money in the world and all the stuff in the world, what combinations of agents could we be using to treat, uh, to treat IBD? So hopefully this is enough of a setup for you to get the next question right. So we have a question for you guys that I think you have to do on your iPads. People are still busy eating, but I see the question. Okay. Oh. Good vibes. <laughs> it's very Vegas sultry music, isn't it? We're probably the only people listening to this music who are not, don't have alcohol in their hand. <laughs> right? Yay! Look at that. Yay. We don't actually get paid for this until, unless you get the questions right and wrong. Okay. <laughs> but let me just push back on this okay. a little bit. Do you think clinically this makes sense? Have you seen patients where you uh, have administered IL-23 and then anti-TNF doesn't work as second line? Does this line up with you? If you, I'm sorry, the, in the model that you... In the clinical care, yeah. does this impact how you sequence your therapies? Um, I don't know if, if this does, remember, this could be, for all we know, this is a subset of people. For all we know, this is a subset of people that are not going to respond to this. Um, again, the, the other, I think the related question is, if you've got someone already on an anti-TNF and now it lost its mojo, could you then give them an, an anti-IL-23 to rescue that phenotype? That has not been answered, and hasn't been answered even in some of the studies that we're gonna be showing you. But it's an interesting question. And then, do we wanna to get to that point, or wouldn't we have wanted not even to be in that situation of causing that level of refractoriness? Um, I liked great. how you said that. I, I would say that I recycle TNF after going to a different mechanism. Yeah. It would be of great interest to know if, if you go to IL-23, um, if that somehow enhances your ability to recycle TNF as a mechanism. Yeah. That's, let's yeah. do that. 
Okay. Let's do that before the next season, Crohn's and Colitis Congress, which I hear is in San Francisco. All right, I'm advancing, but okay, great. I'll, I'll, I'll let David it. take it over. All right, well, let me take you through some of the clinical things. I know that many in this room are clinicians and you have your own observations. And certainly there's been a race to market of some novel IL-23 inhibitors. And I wanna give you the clinical data. I'm not gonna show you a safety, but mostly efficacy. Um, but I'll start with a few important points and then give you some general observations for you to keep in mind as I go through these slides. The first one is to acknowledge the distinct uh, targeting of our antibodies, and you're going to learn a little bit more about this from both Maria and Jessica. But let's just remind you that ustekinumab, the first drug available in both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis that has as its primary mechanism IL-23 inhibition, is actually an anti-P40 antibody. P40 is a subunit that's shared by not just IL-23, but also IL-12. That's why I asked Marie about that question, because we're not really sure what IL-12 does, nor do we understand fully why inhibition of it may or may not um, enhance or worsen the general clinical benefit of the therapy. Distinct from anti-P40 would be anti-P19, a different subunit. And you'll note on this cartoon that P19 is unique to IL-23. So you're not actually targeting or hitting or affecting in any known, known way IL-12. So the therapies that have been developed and are in development for uh, P19 inhibition are IL-23 selective, or at least that's the way we talk about them. Now there's some general observations that we've made as we um, think about these therapies, and I wanna give those to you up front, and then I'm gonna take you through some of the data. The first one is that these therapies and targeting IL-23 works in both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. The second, uh, and not fully explored, is the general observation that they may work better in Crohn's than you see, but they work in both situations, no doubt about it. The third, as we've already touched on, is that they seem to be extraordinarily safe. We don't see activation of latent TB across the world, experience with ustekinumab, and the subsequent IL-23 drugs backs that up. And in general, we think of these as very safe drugs. My very rudimentary um, understanding of this not being uh, an immunologist like Maria has been more that IL-23 acts where you have inflammation and it's not more ubiquitous and involved in infection surveillance or prevention the way TNF does and inhibition of TNF leads to infections. So those are some of the things to keep in mind. And I wanna then go through some of the general trials and, and evidence we have with some basic takeaway messages to put things in context. We'll start with ustekinumab. The UNITY trials looked at ustekinumab for the treatment of Crohn's disease, patients who had not responded to conventional therapies and in some situations had already been exposed to biological strategies. Mostly it was anti-TNF, as we see in many of these trials. And you can see the two induction studies there, UNITY1 and UNITY2. UNITY1 were, by definition, patients who had been TNF exposed. That means usually they were either TNF resistant or lost response to TNF. They could have also, though, received TNF and been intolerant to it. That's what exposed means. And UNITY2, which were predominantly naive patients, they hadn't been exposed to anti-TNF. And of course, in Crohn's, repeatedly we see this theme that when you have been not on other biological therapies, uh, which may be just a marker of shorter disease duration, you do better with whatever therapy you're about to receive. You can also see the immunity study on the right there, which is the maintenance data for ustekinumab. And you can appreciate on the left, induction, which was intravenous, weight-based dosing, six milligrams per kilogram versus a standard dose of 130 milligrams. And on the right, the 90 milligrams every eight or every 12 weeks. In many parts of the world, it's offered at either interval in maintenance phase. In the United States, we use the every eight week, and that's how it was labeled. And in general, that's because, as you can see there, at least numerically, the every eight week worked better. And if you actually looked at subset analyses, every eight week especially works better in patients with complex Crohn's or those who've been exposed to biologics before they get on this drug. The UNIFI trials were used to kinemab in ulcerative colitis. And you can see here, they also looked at the induction um, arms of either 130 milligrams or six mg per kg. And then you can see the standard results there looking at remission, clinical response, and endoscopic healing. In our um, studies of induction, we've looked at standard outcomes after those in infusions, and we have used the six milligram per kilogram dosing. And in maintenance, we've adopted, as I said, the 90 every eight. 
I want to highlight for you what was unique about Unify and things that moved our field forward, as Jansen has nicely done when they developed this um, particular program, is we had for the first time an endpoint of a combined endoscopic and histologic healing. Now, why is that relevant? Well, it was actually the FDA that suggested if you wanted to use the term mucosal healing, it wasn't sufficient to show endoscopic improvement. That was just what you saw with the scope. And true to form, to understand what's happening at the level of the mucosa, we acknowledge there's some role of understanding what the histology looks like. Now, whether that's actually the right endpoint for treating, we haven't completely understood yet, but I would suggest to you that it probably is in some ways. I also want to highlight for you the results that you're seeing here, which is how fast ustekinumab works. And the important thing to understand that is so you can tell patients. If I give you this drug, it's likely if you're going to do well, you're going to notice within the first one or two weeks that you're immediately feeling better. I think that's a really important message. And to, to riff on what I said this morning about small molecules, it suggests you can avoid steroids. And so here are the histoendoscopic mucosal healing data. I want to highlight again for you that uh, the every eight weeks seems to be a better interval for your maintenance. That's why we use it. And you may have patients who ask you to go out every 12. You should know what psoriasis is every 12, but at a lower dose, 45 milligrams. And in general, I haven't um, supported that for most of my patients. Nonetheless, you can see what histoendoscopic healing looks like, but more importantly, you can see some clinical outcomes from it. The patients who achieve that level of healing, endoscopic improvement plus a histological control, were more likely to continue doing well than if they had achieved either one of those endpoints alone. So we've all had patients where it looks okay on scope, but the biopsies show activity you didn't appreciate. And we certainly have patients who look inflamed on scope. We call it some level, but the histology is less. That's very well described. So importantly here, if you have both of those, the endoscopic improvement, which is a Mayo score of zero or one with histology improvement, those patients do much better. So ustekinumab educated us. The mechanism works in Crohn's and UC. We have a novel endpoint in ulcerative colitis that has really set the stage and standard for all of our other UC trials going forward. And we certainly learned a lot about safety and this concept of IV induction and subcutaneous maintenance. So there was much that that did to advance our field. It made sense, though, to start thinking about could we be more selective and what could we do with P19s? We, of course, are following what the dermatologist showed us, which is that they developed P19s to treat psoriasis before we had them, and they demonstrated superior efficacy, and they were very happy with how that therapy looked. The first P19 inhibitor to make it to the US market is Rizinkizumab, which was developed for Crohn's disease, and I'll show you some of the data in development for ulcerative colitis. You can see similarly an IV induction phase, in this case three doses that are IV, and then a subcutaneous maintenance phase. And I won't get into all the details here except to say similar concepts here. Conventional or biofailure patients versus those who are all biofailure. And in general, unlike what we'd seen in many other trials, even when you had been exposed to one, uh, certainly one anti-TNF therapy, but even two anti-TNF therapies, this mechanism worked really well. And understanding the immunology of it would be of interest to all of us, but certainly understanding it from a clinical point of view and knowing that this is an excellent therapy to be considered second line after anti-TNF, let alone first line, makes good sense. So this, uh, these data led to its approval and its availability in Crohn's, and we've been happy with it so far. I also want to highlight for you some uh, ongoing maintenance data, which led to the maintenance uh, dosing for this drug in our Crohn's patients, and clearly shows very nicely. And just to give you the, uh, orient you on the slide, it's clinical remission and endoscopic response. And I want to just point out to you that for a long time, we thought that endoscopic response and even endoscopic remission in Crohn's wasn't possible, that it was something that we would like to see, but we didn't know how to get there. But with our novel therapies, we're starting to see that, and that includes rizinkizumab very nicely. David, do you want to make a comment on that slide? Um, one, of the, one of the other issues that we've come up against as clinicians is the dosing of these medications, trying to get approval for shortening the interval of, say, infliximab, sure. shortening whatever. If I'm understanding this, this on the extreme left is essentially 
they got one dose in, in induction and no more. And that, right, looking? those are the patients who got randomized to placebo in maintenance. Right. I think it's worth mentioning that. Uh, and sometimes people say, um, well, what happened to them in maintenance then? How long did the drug carry over? The other thing we often talk about is a placebo response that's carrying over. And uh, that's of interest to know as well. You don't see the placebo called out separately here. Um, but I do want to highlight for you that um, the patients there that you see, 41% clinical remission, this is in maintenance after only getting an IV loading, the IV loading doses. So they're not on maintenance dosing. All the way out to a year, you have 41% of patients who are still in clinical remission. I think that's what you're getting at. Yeah. And of course, that's not as good as the patients who got drug in maintenance, but it's not horrible. And it leads you to ask, number one, what's the durability of the therapy? And secondly, um, what should we think about in terms of who are those patients and who does well as we follow them out? If you look at the subset analyses in these cases, it ends up being people who had early response, like they do well with the drug, mm -hmm. that mechanism right away. We know those patients. And it also ends up being the people who achieve endoscopic control so that they're likely to achieve a deeper level of remission. So when you get into maintenance phase and you're giving them placebo, they seem to be stable over time. Did you want to make another point about that? No, I mean, I, I, I guess I um, you know, agree completely. It also means that that at least we're getting closer, to, hopefully, to having doses that are the right doses for these, uh, for these medications. Oh, right. So your comment, though, about dose escalation, I didn't right. want to say that. Uh, in the earliest days of ustekinumab, yeah. and you'll comment further on this, Jessica, um, we had our first 500 patients with Crohn's who we gave Usta at the University of Chicago. Um, one out of five, 20% of them, um, were those who we either needed or we tried to get right. dose escalation mm -hmm. for. And that was a larger number than perhaps we would have anticipated, but it's not uncommon. We all take care of patients with IBD and see that they seem to need dose escalation. And to your point earlier, Maria, and to Jessica's work as well, we did not see dose escalation work in people who were primary non-responders. No. It was the people who were res responders but not remitters, or the people who remitted but then lost response where dose escalation worked. That's all with ustekinumab. With rizinkizumab in Crohn's, we've, we've only tried to give dose escalation to a small number. We haven't gotten insurance approval for many of them. And I'm not sure if it's at the same rate as what we saw with Usta, but I think it's early for us to know that in the real world. I don't know, Jessica, what do yeah, you think? We've done something similar. So, and I, I'll go through this a little bit more during my section, but similarly, we have found that in the patients who are primary non-responders, really there's very little utility in dose escalation in, in the ustekinumab population. Um, but there, there is a good percentage of patients, about 50% actually, who will recapture with dose escalation if they've had a partial response or a secondary loss of response. I'm curious though, as we're presenting, we're talking about doses. Do either of you ever use the 180 dose or are you exclusively using the 360? I'm only using 360. Right, only using the 360. Similar. Same. I think with the safety, and even if it's only a numerical edge, uh, and also maybe because we're in a referral-based sort of biased yeah. practice, right. I stick with the higher doses right. otherwise. Right. But I'm sure others in the room may have some experience differently, and you'll teach us about that too. Rizinkizumab is being studied in ulcerative colitis. These are phase three data that have been presented. And just to orient you to the, these results, this is a stacked bar where you have the clinical response in light blue and clinical remission in dark blue at 12 weeks after induction phase that's uh, similar to what we do with Crohn's. And you can appreciate that the therapy clearly works in this disease state, and of course, we're expecting it to move forward. Now let's move on to a different P19 inhibitor. This is mirakizumab, which is now available in the US for ulcerative colitis, moderate to severe UC. And uh, similarly, we have an IV induction phase and then subcutaneous maintenance phasing. Here's the week 12 induction data, looking at clinical remission, stacked bar again, green is clinical response, blue clinical remission, and then the randomized responders went into the maintenance phase and showing you the primary and secondary outcomes of interest with mirakizumab. You've also seen that um, Lilly, who developed mirakizumab, invested in understanding and studying rectal and bowel urgency as one of the things they were interested in. And I certainly support as a very important symptom amongst our patients. 
There's nothing specifically unique to mirakizumab that treats urgency, um, but I certainly appreciate the value of studying it so we can include it and think about it in all the other therapies we use and always ask patients about it. And we did include it in the ulcerative colitis guidelines from the ACG uh, in 2019, and it is being included in the next version of those that we're finishing now. Now, also, mirakizumab is being studied in Crohn's. Not surprisingly, why wouldn't they? So these are the results of the phase three study called Serenity, looking at mirakizumab, and you can see week 12 results here. If you're keeping score, you'll note that these results are similar to risenkizumab. Again, not head to head, but nonetheless, you can appreciate it. And you can see dose ranging here, which interestingly suggested that the 600 milligram dose, the middle dose, was better. Uh, with mirakizumab, and uh, we'll see how, how that proceeds and which dose is going to ultimately be the winner, and I think 600 will probably be it. Janssen has their own P19 inhibitor. This drug has been on the market and for psoriasis already and has been studied in both UC and Crohn's. It's called gusalcumab, and you can see here the similar design, IV loading um, uh, induction phase. And then the maintenance of injection, which I'll show you in a second. <coughs> Excuse me. I've been talking all day. I'll, I'll, I'll um, drink some water. Um, I want to say to you, some people have said that they like the video. Yes, everything is going to be available online, so you could use it for... They're saying that while I'm presenting? Whatever, yeah. whatever. Go back to the video. <laughs> the, 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 the video of the little, like yeah, the I little the, the animated graphics. Um, See, AI is going to replace all of us. That's right. <laughs> the, um, the other question, actually, David, that uh, before you get into Gus more deeply, if a person doesn't respond, if a patient doesn't respond within the first week after they get used to kinemab, do you change course? I mean, I, I suppose it's a broader question of when do you get out of dodge? And we can say it broadly, I think, for this class. When do you get out of dodge? Well, in the original Eustachinumab trial, it was designed that if you didn't respond to the IV induction at that primary induction endpoint, yeah. you were eligible to get a second IV dose. And there were some patients who were captured that way, and so there seemed to be a benefit. Right. We're going to talk about the POWER study, which explored that for patients who were responders and lost response. So there's a difference between primary non-responders, where giving them a second dose might have value, and whether we can get it, first of all, and people who are loss of response, and that's what Jessica, I think, will teach us more about, where it doesn't seem to have as much value, if I can say the punchline. Uh, getting back to Gus, um, you can see the induction data, and you see here, again, we have two different doses compared with placebo, and you can see that the doses look similar, but what's of great interest is how the, the maintenance study was designed, where there were um, some options to consider here uh, and think about in terms of how patients would follow up. Um, and you can appreciate uh, the complexity of this, but looking at what IV dose followed by what injection dose uh, for maintenance would be the best combination. And it looks like the 600 to 200 is the winner here in doing well. And those are quite, respo quite impressive response and remission rates out to week 48, a very effective therapy in Crohn's. And we're gonna hear um, the potential uh, immunologic and molecular explanation for that uh, particular very nice observation. And of course, Gus is also being studied in ulcerative colitis, and we'll be talking lots more about that as well. Yeah. David, I have another question for you. Um, how do you define endoscopic response? And I actually think in this context, I'd like to say not necessarily, you know, there's always that technical definition in each study. You have to read the fine print of how they defined endoscopic response. But what do you say to your, 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 your colleagues, your GI colleagues, in terms of um, what, they, what should they be looking for? How, how should they be evaluating the, the, you know, by colonoscopy to make that decision? Well, I'll start by saying that endoscopic response is only part of how I assess patients who are responding to therapy in Crohn's. And I prefer looking at serum CRP. I prefer looking at, of course, the patient reported outcomes. And then when I do endoscopic assessments, um, I am certainly looking for uh, either complete healing of the bowel, which is possible and happens, or at least substantial improvement of the ulcers. And um, of course, as you're experienced, and there's many in this room who are, you can appreciate when an ulcer is healing 
versus one that hasn't changed at all. You also probably have a pretty good pretest probability of those ulcers that seem like they're not going to heal when you see those deep furrowing sort of bear claw types of ulcerations. But I've seen those heal too. Right. I would add to this that there's a role for intestinal ultrasound that may redefine what this means. And um, in the Eustachinumab experience, looking at a study we're going to talk about called Stardust, and you'll hear more about it, there was an intestinal ultrasound arm. But from the standpoint of as clinicians, it's enabling us to look much sooner than we used to. So you used to say, well, let's do a colonoscopy at six months and see how you're doing. Now we're starting to say, let's look at four weeks or six weeks and get a sense of how your transmural inflammation is improving. And so not only, I've been emphasizing this to the ultrasound community, not only does that enable earlier time to make treatment decisions, it also gives us new insight into pathogenesis and bowel healing in ways we'd ever appreciated or could even measure. So I think that that's a whole other conversation, but I think it's very important. Right. And I usually, whatever I'm doing, I usually plan six weeks after I start a therapy to do something objective to reassess. That's really great. All right, so um, what, you know, so far David has told you about, obviously this mechanism is effective. We're gonna have, you know, we already have multiple choices and we have some already in the pipeline that are, I'm sure, going to get approval for Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. So then it begs the question, how are we gonna differentiate between these different IL-23 targeting agents? So I'm gonna ask you a question. I know you're all overachievers. You should not know the answer to this question. But you could. But you could, you might. If you do, great. If you don't, um, my hope is that by the, by the next time you see this question, hint, 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 that you'll, ha you'll, you'll know the answer. We'll cue, the, cue the music. No. Okay. <laughs> we clearly did not review the music before. It's going to be a rider on the contract next time. Do we not get to see people's choices? Oh, we don't choices? get to see? No. Uh, Maybe later. not till the post. Later, it's a pre-test question. All right. So I want to tell you a little bit about FC gamma receptors, um, and, and I'll try to make this as painless as possible so that no one is asleep um, in the next few minutes. You know, imagine that you have antibodies that now you know, the immune system has made antibodies and coating a bacteria, right? So now they're coating a bacteria. How does that get rid of a bacterium, right? Because that's, again, the immune system is all designed around trying to get rid of pathogens and protecting us. Well, there are these receptors, FC gamma, you know, gamma as in like the gamma chain of an IgG molecule that can bind to these receptors on the, um, the these, these are receptors on the surface of professional eating cells, phagocytic cells, like macrophages and dendritic cells, so that they can say, kind of stick to the, the bacteria that's coated with, with, uh, with immunoglobulin so they can eat it and get rid of it, so we can get rid of the infection. So that's the purpose of it in biology. But let me talk, to, but then biology wasn't assuming that we we're gonna be giving monoclonal antibodies against cytokines, right? to treat a disease, or monoclonal antibodies against anything to treat a disease. So it, it turns out that FC gamma receptor one, otherwise known as CD64, because of course immunologists always have two names for everything, right? Cluster differentiation CD64, are, are expressed on monocytes and macrophages. This is true in the gut. It's also true in other, you know, if, I was, if this was a derm talk, we'd say that it's in skin. If this is a, uh, a talk on arthritis, it, we'd say that this is in, in joints. So these FC gamma receptors bind to immunoglobulins, and in particular to IgG1. And it turns out that, at, you know, again, fun fact, many of the biologics that we use are IgG1, right? So that means that in the native state, uh, FC gamma receptors should be binding to our normal, uh, you know, uh, any monoclonal antibody that any company would make that is IgG1, okay? That's, that's the background. But the other thing you should know is that often companies purposefully mutate so that the IgG, the synthetic IgG that they've made cannot bind to FC gamma receptors. On purpose, they do that. So, that, there is, so that, that that takes that out of the equation that these cells are involved. It just allows the monoclonal antibody to do one thing, which is only to bind the target. In this case, we're gonna talk about IL-23. So it turns out, again, as a background for what I'm about to show you, that Rizinkizumab, they chose to mutate, like most biologics, this region that would allow it to bind to FC gamma receptors, whereas Gaselkimab, 
is the native IgG1, like as if the, as if the body had made it naturally, and therefore it can bind to FC gamma receptors. And we're about to see what that actually translates into or potentially translates into at the level of what's happening in the mucosa. So here is an, uh, you know, an immunoglobulin, we'll call this IG1, right? That means that if going, going, taking you back to medical school, that the heavy chain is the gamma receptor of, uh, of immunoglobulin. And so um, it, this is the native, uh, this would be the example of, say, gacelcomab, uh, whereas in the case of uh, rizinkizumab, it purposely you know, had, a, had a, a genetic engineering so that this FC gamma could not bind to um, this could not bind to FC gamma receptors. Um, I'm not going to show you the data, but both of these antibodies, and I'm assuming mirakizumab too, by the way, are extremely good at binding interleukin-23. As you know, it binds the P19 unit, right? Because we know it's different than, than used to kinemab. But they're very effective, uh, equally effective, at binding uh, IL-23 molecules in solution. OK, so, that's, so there's that. Now we remember we're back to this inflammatory myeloid cell that's busy making interleukin-23, activating these Th17 molecules, right? So this cell is making IL-23, turning on and upsetting these Th17 cells that are going to go on to develop, you know, cause uh, uh, bad IBD. In the case of something like rizinkizumab that has this uh, mutated, you know, uh, gamma chain of, the, of, the, of IgG1, it cannot bind the surface of that monocyte that's expressing FC gamma receptors, okay? It, so all the binding of interleukin-23 is happening in solution, is happening in solution, but not on the surface of the cell. So here's the cell making it. It's binding it in solution, not, not sort of targeted to the cell that's making it. By contrast here, um, if you have a, you know, a normal IgG1, in this case it's gacelcomab, it can bind the FC gamma receptors on the surface of the actual cell that is busy making interleukin-23. And there's biological evidence, you know, experimental evidence, I should say, that in point of fact, this is happening, that you can stimulate a cell, it will make interleukin-23, and the cell command bound to the cell itself is busy capturing the, the, the uh, generated interleukin-23. So this is actually something we can show, I say we, the royal we, not me, can show experimentally is happening in the case of gacelcomab that happens not to occur with rizikizumab. Again, I'll make the point that in solution, they're both binding beautifully uh, interleukin-23. Okay, so with that as a backdrop. So does the, the implication is that it may be clinically more effective, clinically more durable? What do you think this will translate into? Yeah, that in a sense that now you're getting this extra bang for your buck because now this interleukin-23 that's being secreted by the cell can't go very far because it's going to be, some of it is going to be captured. What proportion is captured locally versus makes it out into its nearby environment to then come in contact with the antibody, that remains to be seen. But it may, what would be curious is, you know, um, I don't know about you, but I'm not busy looking at the dosing of these medications, right? Some of the doses are, are very different in terms of milligrams, in terms of milligrams, and presumably these are all this, about the same molecular weight, right? Immunoglobulins, whether they're, you know, they should be about the same molecular weight. And so maybe it, it uh, represents that. Um, I certainly think that these, these drugs are safe, so it's not an issue of safety one way or another, but I think it's a curious thing that, that this occurs. Um, the other curious thing is that uh, this, this mechanism of action, um, it highlights how, you know, there are all these little subtle differences between these medications that we use, and only over time do we appreciate, like, why there might be differences in efficacy. But, you know, to your point, David, we'll see if that changes the equation of, of rapidity or of efficacy or of durability of response. So my follow-on question is just, if you were going to measure a serum concentration of guselcomab, oh. is it going to reflect adequately what we need to see, or is there a much greater percentage of the antibody that's actually bound to cells that we're not going to even appreciate that we used to not know about? Right. 
Um, I just reviewed a paper that has to do with anti-TNFs and actually harkens back to the work that, um, that Andres Yar did uh, when he was at, at the University of Miami that looked at tissue concentrations of, uh, infliximab, of infliximab. And to cut to the chase. And TNF. They also measured TNF. I don't want to say too much about the paper. I don't remember who wrote it and if you could possibly be here in the audience. But I thought I, you wrote I, it with Andres. No, no. This re paper I just reviewed. Oh. I just reviewed a paper for Sorry. the IBD Journal. I don't know that. And I, I was talking uh, about your and, paper. Yeah, I know you're talking about our paper. But um, they found very similar things to our paper. But what was nice about their paper is that in their paper, what they found was that the tissue levels of the anti-TNF did a better job of predicting the long term whether they were going to respond for a longer period of time. So um, the, the tip of the iceberg is what we're measuring in serum. It, it's just, t you know, measuring in tissue, of course, is always going to be more cumbersome, but probably is going to be very edifying. And, it, and back to what David is asking me, you, one wonders if with this mechanism, will this allow there to be greater local concentrations of this antibody? Um, th that's all speculative, by the way. What I'm saying is all speculative. Because again, because I, you know, maybe you're going to see this question again. Giselkimab can bind this CD64, whereas you know, Rizinkizumab can't. All right. Guess what? We have the question again. Who knew? <laughs> Not me. No, we had no idea. All right, so now you get a, a second chance for your overachievers. To hear the music. <laughs> to, hear the, to hear the music. Still with no booze in hand. Look at that. Gosh. Good job. Great job. This is stressful. <laughs> this is stressful. So Good. thank you. Before I move on into the next section, we've got a couple of questions from the audience here. Um, so for patients that have either lost or had partial response to ustekinumab, would you consider using an IL-23 in those patients, or do you feel like they've then failed the mechanism and you should move on? Well, in the Rizinkizumab Crohn study, they allowed patients to have been exposed to ustekinumab. Those data have been presented, and uh, it worked. 50% of the patients who had prior used experience had a response to Rizinkizumab. And in our own experience at UFC, we've described that and published it as well. It was almost 75%. So I think the answer to that is yes. Um, I would ask the opposite, which is if you start with a P19, is there value to going to a P40 to use tekinumab second? And we don't have the data on that as usual. We're sort of going linearly, but we need to think about that because I think there may be value to understanding that. I have a colleague who believes it is true, but we need to prove it. And then along those lines, Maria, is there a ideal patient either Crohn's or UC, where you feel like this is really the agent you should be using first line, this mechanism? That's a great question. You know, in the early days of ustekinumab, I used to think, well, it, in that rare exception where someone has granulomatous Crohn's disease, maybe they'll respond better, right? And, and that turned out not to be the case, not to be the case. I think what we're learning is that ileal Crohn's disease behaves very differently than colonic Crohn's disease. It certainly responds slower to therapy, and the gene expression at every level, even when in, in isolated lymphocytes or in isolated monocytes and macrophages from ileum compared to colon, they're different. Um, but at least in subgroup analysis, everybody seems, if they're gonna respond, they respond, right? The ileum takes longer to improve, right? The, when people have spent the time to look at endoscopy results, I'm not sure that this has been studied as carefully with this, but in that, in that same study that David was alluding to that looks at um, endoscopic um, intestinal ultrasound in people who are on, a, on ustekinumab, again, the ileum was slower to respond compared to the colon always responds faster. So I'm not sure I, don't, I have an answer. I'd love to know that answer, actually. I think we're going to put a little bit of energy into that. Um, I think it's worth putting energy into it now that we have this new generation of version 2.0 and have these IL-23 inhibitors, which are clearly very effective, so that we can really understand, since it's a more, in my mind, black and white signal, 
these IL-23 inhibitors, can we find a phenotype? But a priori, I think we'll get to it, like how we, we, we'd, we would position this, but this seems to work well and is very safe, and, if, and, and I often am erring on the side of starting with this therapy. I'd prefer to start with this therapy than anti-TNF generally. Go for it. All right, so we've really set this section up quite nicely, so thank you to my co-presenters. So really, we've talked talked a lot about the efficacy of these agents, um, but what happens if you start to lose response? How can you really optimize this mechanism? Um, and then how do we think about rational combination therapies? So we're going to go through some of the data that has helped start to sort this out. So we've mentioned the POWER study, um, but what the POWER study was is really looking at patients with moderate to severe Crohn's disease who had already been initiated on ustekinumab. They had already undergone IV induction and were already in the maintenance phase and had experienced a secondary loss of response. So these are patients who had initially done well and are now losing response. And at that time, they enter into the study and are randomized either to an IV reinduction, so they get another IV loading dose, or they're basically continued on this standard sub-Q maintenance. So none of these patients were on Q4 or Q6 week dosing, only Q8 week standard dosing, which I think is important to note. And I think you might think, well, why do this study? I think there's a lot, there was a lot of initial question around, would IV reloading actually be better than just increasing the sub-Q dose to Q4, Q6, which one had been quite hard to get from an insurance standpoint, and two is very expensive. So if we could potentially recapture these patients with an IV reload, could we keep them then on the standard eight-week dose? So I think that's sort of a little bit of the background going into this study, and you can see here um, the time points at which patients were assessed, and the primary endpoint was really looking at a clinical response at week 16. And I know we, we sort of mentioned this already, but the, the spoiler alert was that unfortunately this study did not ultimately meet its primary endpoint. As you can see here among all comers into the study, there wasn't a statistically significant difference of clinical response at week 16, although you can appreciate that there is a numerical difference um, of the proportion of patients who did achieve a clinical response at week 16 in the IV reload group compared to the sub-Q maintenance group. And that holds true for patients who are bio-naive, although the numbers of the bio-naive patients in the study are, are pretty small. Um, those who had, had experienced one prior biologic and two, but you see that that starts to fall off once the patients are very exposed, three or more. And then when we look at the endoscopic remission um, rates here at week 16 as well, um, you see a, basically a marginal, uh, you know, a P value of 0.04 among all the patients who had experienced this outcome with the IV reload compared to those in the sub-Q maintenance, but we don't see those signals across you know, the different individual subtypes, um, significantly so, um, for the most part. So I think, again, ultimately this study did not meet its primary endpoint, um, but if you start to look at some of the subgroup analyses that were done in the study, um, you, you ask yourself, well, should we be doing this in some patients? Is this a rational strategy? Um, and I think a lot of it ultimately in clinical practice depends on where you practice. In my region, I find getting IV reloads almost impossible. I don't know if you guys have anything different, but I actually have an easier time um, escalating the sub-Q maintenance. And so that was one of the reasons why we chose to study this a bit more in depth. And so as we've been sort of discussing throughout the study at our group, we did look at what happened to patients who had lost response to ustekinumab and then were escalated to either Q4 or Q6 weak dosing, and we found that about 50% of patients did recapture with that maintenance dose escalation. Um, and now we're actually in a prospective way studying, is there a difference between Q4 and Q6? Because I think we don't really know the difference between those two dosing strategies. Um, are you guys doing more IV reloads in practice, or you tend to just shorten your dosing interval? I, I haven't. I, I have a couple questions for you, though. Please. My first question is, when you look at something like this, which is a pretty hard objective endpoint, yeah. endoscopic remission, yeah. there's clearly benefit here. Yeah. And so which patient, give us a phenotype of somebody in whom you would really do this if, if cost wasn't an issue. And then I'm going to ask my next question, which is maybe instead of IV, yeah. what about giving two injections, giving a double sub-Q dose? Is that going to be similar in pharmacokinetics, and would you consider it? My third is, does this do the same in UC, or do you think it's all Crohn's? 
Those are all great questions. And so I do think ultimately when you see this study, yes, it ultimately didn't meet its primary endpoint, but I agree there is some there is some interest here and there clearly are some patients who will derive benefit from this method, you know, of recapture. And so I think to me again, for those who have had a primary non-response, I don't find that sort of going through these great lengths to try to recapture has been very helpful or successful in my own practice and in what's been published. Um, so I think that the patient who has had a secondary loss of response, I do think there is utility in either, you know, in doing an IV reload and honestly, and sometimes I'll then also potentially shorten the interval of maintenance depending on what we found. And I think to your point, endoscopic remission is a hard endpoint. If you had seen endoscopic response, the patient was starting to feel better, you probably wouldn't give up on that therapy also depending on where they were in their treatment cycle. Is this a patient who's already failed multiple things and you're actually starting to derive some benefit? You're not gonna give up so easily in that patient population. Um, and so to, to answer, ultimately answer your question, yes, I would be doing this in a number of patients, but we have had uh, a few instances to your question around the sub Q where we couldn't get this approved and we actually worked really closely with our pharmacy team to actually mimic the IV load with sub-Q and actually were able to do that uh, instead and actually had good success with that as well. So I think, do think there is some utility in the, you know, sort of updosing the sub-Q, giving a bit more that way and actually doing the same thing you would be with the IV reload. Or have you done something similar? I, I have. Since I you have, asked the question, I'm no, assuming you did. I, 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 this wasn't a setup. I, I have done it in a few yeah. people. I, I don't know to say whether it's as effective as this would be. But to me, this is, a me this is also reflecting the challenges we face in clinical trials, yeah. right? Yeah. Looking at an endpoint that gives you a negative result when you look at other things where there's clearly some value in some patients. Yeah. And it's so important to figure out who those people are. I think it, it needs to be said. Absolutely. My last question was about ulcerative colitis. Oh, sorry, thank you. It was so many questions, you know, it was just, yeah, I sorry. lost them. So I do find, you know, I think, in, and you actually just showed us quite nicely a lot of the clinical trial data. And I do think overall the data with IL-23 does look quite impressive and, and pretty good across the board with all the agents in Crohn's disease. It does seem to look, for whatever reason, I think sl slightly less impressive in ulcerative colitis, you know, if you look at the absolute numbers. Um, and so I think as we just have our first IL-23 on the market for ulcerative colitis, I think figuring out where that fits in the treatment paradigm, at least for me personally, I haven't quite figured that out yet where I'm using it. I think for Crohn's though, the story seems to be quite clear. I think for ulcerative colitis, um, wh which patient population is gonna derive the most benefit really is this first line or should be used more second or further, I'm, I still haven't really figured that out for myself. And meanwhile, you know, um, in rheumatology, for example, they don't bother trying to squeeze more oh, juice yeah. out of the lemon. They move on to the next drug in class. <laughs> and now we have multiple agents, so yeah. that may be Absolutely. somewhat of a moot point. Do you do anything different, Maria? I didn't want no, to leave I you mean, out I, of this. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm enjoying sitting here and just listening to, <laughs> to you guys talk about this. I think so much, like, I don't know, it seems like sometimes, um, all of a sudden, it's easy to get a, you know yeah. to get um, used to kinemab approved for every four weeks, and sometimes it's absolutely impossible. And we're left to actually often I'm getting it a, a reload can be easy, or yeah. to, to get you know. And I've often wanted for certain types of patients, like say Medicare, to just be able to give it IV, IV. all the time because then our, then we could actually give it to these patients. So there's stuff that is too depressing to talk about without mm -hmm. sort of SSRIs. Um, Cue the music. At the table, yeah, seriously. At the table. So, uh, but so there's so there's that dimension of the, yeah. the, the like we can speculate and talk and like all the stuff because again this is like kind of a short term fix. I can't help but think okay, it's a yeah. like maybe gets the party started, but in, ultimately these are patients yeah. that probably need to have more frequent dosing, yeah. and that's probably where the why it didn't yeah. look even better, right? Yeah. I think. Okay. And I think the reality is, if in practice, if I am doing this, I'm probably doing both. I'm usually not doing one and just saying, right. I, I hope yeah. this works out. So let's talk about a potential different strategy to really try to optimize our patients. So this is the Stardust study, which we had heard alluded to. And this is really looking at, again, ustekinumab, um, but using a treat to target sort of methodology as opposed to more a standard of care strategy. And so if you're not familiar with the term treat to target, um, you know, this comes to us from the stride guidance and really looking at sort of rational objective targets that you're gonna follow in patients 
And if you're not hitting those targets, you're going to dose adjust to make sure that you're hitting those targets as opposed to a, the sort of more standard of care strategy where you're doing it based solely on symptoms, right? The patient starts to not feel well, and so then you dose adjust in response to that. And so what this study looked at was patients who were receiving ustekinumab, again, with Crohn's disease. They went through induction and then a maintenance dose, and then at the week 16 mark, they were assessed, and those who had responded, so they were initial responders to ustekinumab, were essentially randomized to either this treat-to-target, more strict, um, you know, sort of follow-up strategy as opposed to standard of care. Um, and patients were the followed out um, quite far to really look at which arm did better. You know, if we're really following these patients quite closely, ultimately will we have better outcomes? And the clinical targets that were assessed in this study um, were clinical, you know, CDAI scores, biomarker targets, so looking at CRP, looking at fecal calprotectin. As we heard, there was um, an ultrasound component to this as well. Um, and so really, again, looking at objective markers as opposed to just how the patient was feeling clinically. And so when we look at the data, again, looking at clinical response, clinical remission, and some of those, that biomarker normalization, um, and this is looking out at week 48, ultimately there was, uh, th this study looked at the standard of care arm, uh, the treat-to-target arm, excuse me, did not necessarily do better than the standard of care arm. Um, and when we look at the data across all of the different primary and secondary endpoints that were assessed. Um, and so even just thinking about that, uh, what, does that rationally make sense to you, David? I mean, do you, when you saw the outcomes of this study, did you think that makes no sense to me? Well, it gets back to symptom-based endpoints versus yeah. more objective measures, as well as the complexity of if we're just going to look at uh, changing dosing intervals without yeah. considering the pharmacodynamics of the therapy or the targets we're trying to treat, we're missing big mm -hmm. components and compartments of this equation. Yeah. And I think that that's the challenge. On the other hand, as a clinician, it's helpful to know, and you do yeah. need to make some decisions. It does drive us home, though, to the, the era we're now in, which is an era to think about disease modification and not just symptom management. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But just to like, say a happy note, the rates of remission are really very high. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's well, the, sort of... The happy yeah. note to me is the next slide, which the audience can't see yet, which is some of the end of, like the yeah. more objective measures. So that there is value yeah. to this. And it gets back to this question again, which is sort of a theme here at this whole meeting, certainly in the morning's uh, wonderful keynote, is we need to have some better therapeutic biomarkers. Absolutely. And so again, to sort of wrap up Stardust, this, in this study, ultimately, as noted, there were no significant differences in the rate of endoscopic response between the two, but you can see this numeric difference, um, again, of the more objective markers. And my, personally, I do practice with the treat to target um, sort of methodology in my practice. I, I think that we know that there is generally a poor correlation between clinical symptoms and objective markers, especially in Crohn's, although that is true in ulcerative colitis as well. And so I, find, I always say, like, when I ultimately do that scope, I don't want to be surprised. I want to know already what I'm going to find. So I like, fo you know, following objective markers along the way so that you can really dose, optimize, or adjust as needed. So that is how I practice. Um, but in this study, again, dose escalation rates were about 42% in the treat-to-target group. So again, patients were not hitting those outcomes, so we were making an adjustment, compared to 30% in the standard of care arm. So it's not that nobody was getting dose optimized in the standard of care arm, just slightly less. Um, and shortening of dose intervals, notably of course did lead to increase in the ustekinumab trough levels, but that did not significantly increase endoscopic or clinical response rates. Again, so thinking about TDM in, with these mechanisms, how do we think about trough levels? Are you guys doing TDM in this mechanism or looking at trough levels to? No. Um, no but for ustekinumab. For ustekinumab. I do. I think it's helpful if they're very low. I think mm -hmm. it's occasionally helpful when it's almost zero and then we could get approval for another IV load, as an example. Yeah. Um, Honestly, insurance is probably the biggest there driver. There is one of payer, or at least one payer, who requires a yeah. ustekinumab level before they'll let you do anything. Yeah. Same. It's interesting how they cherry pick data to decide such things. Right, right, right. And then after you order that level that they wanted you to get, they tell the patient it was experimental. Yeah. <laughs> Incredible. So the last section that I'm going to be covering, and we, again, I think Maria set this up beautifully, is really thinking about combinations of therapies. You know, 
Unfortunately, we still have a lot of uh, room for improvement with regards to response rates and res regard to which patients are responding to what drug. And until we have that holy grail test that tells us which mechanism patients are going to respond to, you know, a lot of what we're doing is trial and error, unfortunately. And so thinking about, especially some of these very refractory patients, should we be layering different mechanisms on to really be able to achieve some of those higher response rates um, that we ultimately hope for? And this could look, you know, several ways. Maybe you put them on at the same time. Maybe you're layering them. Um, and so I think that there's certainly a lot of discovery now happening in this space and thinking about what combinations make sense both from an efficacy standpoint, but also, of course, from a safety standpoint, I think is is really important. And there's some investigation going on to this work. So, of course, we're here talking mostly about IL-23s. And so there is a lot of work going into looking at um, anti-IL-23s plus anti-TNF. And I think as we heard earlier from Maria about this um, TNF resistance story, I think there is a biologic plausibility as to why this combination really does make sense. You know, are you potentially then really potentiating that anti-TNF to hopefully work better. I think David's question earlier about the sequencing of this, I think is really interesting. And I'm, I'm down to do that study that we just proposed. So, um, But we have data from the Vega study, which I will share with you in just a minute. Um, and again, these are looking at combinations of anti-TNF and anti-IL-23s. The DUET programs are ongoing. Um, so for both Crohn's and UC. Um, and so hopefully we'll have some readout data from those. Not too long, they actually enrolled quite quickly. Um, there are other mechanism combinations that are being looked at. So um, anti-integrant plus anti-TNF plus methotrexate um, is another sort of combination combination trial that is also ongoing. But here's the Vega study, and so this looked at golimumab, gaselkamab, or the combination, and this is an ulcerative colitis patients. Um, and so this study had an induction phase that was the combination phase, which again, patients were either on monotherapy with either of these agents or combination, and then they all moved into a monotherapy phase. Um, everyone in the gaselkamab or combination arm went on to GUS. If you received golimumab initially, you stayed on golimumab in the monotherapy phase. And so here is the clinical uh, endpoints. And as you can see here in the combination arm, we see pretty impressive uh, both clinical response and remission rates, um, both at week 12. Um, and then uh, we see a, a slight drop off in response, but actually an increase in remission, you know, leading out. So potentially if you did well at induction, I and mean, again, these are patients who were dropped off the anti-TNF um, out at the week 38 endpoint. Um, and we see in second place, essentially in this study, you see the gaselkamab arm um, looking quite good as well. And so there does seem to be um, some real, uh, some real interest and, and rational explanation for why we might do combination, whether it be upfront just for induction or even further out in maintenance. And I think once we see the readouts from the duet studies, we'll have a lot more information about this. Great. Yeah. This is really interesting. Actually, they, I hope I'm not revealing confidences, but they've, they've been busy trying to understand molecularly what's happening. And what I find interesting is that the, the anti-TNF treated patients have a lot of, there's a lot of immunological effects systemically. That kind of makes sense, right? Because, you know, you give an anti-TNF and it's working on a lot of different things. Whereas most of the effects of the IL-23 are locally happening in the gut. And so um, it'll be interesting to see when do, can you peel off the other one? Do you really need both of them for yeah. a long time? Like what is the ideal um, thing? So lots of questions. We'll turn it over to David to bring sure. us home. Yeah, so the, for the final few slides, it's just about what have we learned regarding um, superiority of one agent over another, and how can we interpret that in terms of clinical sequencing, which treatment to use first, or when we might consider something, at least from an efficacy point of view. But I will comment on safety. So we do have a head-to-head -head trial, the first one available in Crohn's disease, which was called C-View, which compared ustekinumab to adalimumab. And I wanna point out to you a couple things about this, which I thought was a strength and very interesting. Number one is that these were patients who were bio-naive. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, bio-naive is usually a measure also of shorter disease duration, especially in moderate to severe Crohn's. And you can see the schema here in which patients were randomized to either ADA or ustekinumab at standard dosing, very well designed with placebo IV, if you're getting adalimumab and placebo injection, if you're getting ustekinumab and specifically looking out at the primary endpoint, which was clinical remission at week 52, as well as a number of secondary endpoints. 
The pretest hypothesis was that ustekinumab would be superior to adalimumab, but as you'll see here in the primary and major secondary endpoint, the two were equally effective. But I'll, to the point made earlier about a different study, I will highlight for you the quite nice remission rates out to a year. Look at this, 61% with adalimumab and 65% with ustekinumab. And I always tell people, this is what you might expect if you use the right drug early in a disease course. And you don't select out people who've already failed multiple therapies and throw them into a clinical trial. So as depressing as it has been for us in many ways to see very low remission rates in some of our phase three trials, look what you can get when you treat early. On the other hand, it didn't demonstrate ustekinumab uh, um, being superior from an efficacy point of view. And when you look at other things like steroid-free remission, et cetera, there were similarities across the board. The one interesting thing is there were uh, more dropouts in the adalimumab arm related to injection problems. So I would suggest that it's telling us about tolerability, and tolerability wasn't quite as good with ADA, and these were citrate-free adalimumab injections. The safety was similar. So as much as we've emphasized the local, what we think may be local, effective IL-23 and anti-IL-23, and the safety of the therapy and all the trials in our world experience, we also see in a clinical trial like this that there was not much difference. And it also gets to what we've learned is that one of the major adverse events in clinical trials is disease worsening from ineffective therapy. You use effective therapies, you get less adverse events, things tend to even out. And I think it's an important message for patients. The second head-to-head -head trial we've had in Crohn's also involves ustekinumab. This is risenkizumab compared with ustekinumab head-to-head, but I want to highlight for you in this trial, this is not bio-naive. These are people who were TNF exposed, so they had already been on anti-TNF. So just to keep it clean, and I want to make sure you understand that if you have a patient who's already been on anti-TNF and now you're looking to go to an IL-23 therapy, this is trying to answer the question, is the P19 therapy, risenkizumab, superior to the P40 therapy, ustekinumab? And actually, unlike what you saw in C-view in bio-naive patients against adalimumab, when you look at RISA versus USTA, the P19 here was superior to ustekinumab in the primary and all the ranked secondary endpoints. Actually did quite nicely here. And I wanna highlight for you that this is of interest, but it also is across disease states. There are head-to-head -head trials that compare RISA to ustekinumab in plaque psoriasis. Same outcome, same benefit here demonstrated. And there are additional studies looking at RISA compared to adalimumab in plaque psoriasis, where RISA was superior to adalimumab. So I think we can learn from this. And then the question, of course, becomes, how would you position these therapies? Is this efficacy difference one that will uh, make you consider this drug over USTA? Remember, though, this is in patients who were TNF exposed. So specifically that group of people. I would suggest to you that C-view informs us a little bit, but the real world and other evidence would suggest that in bio-naive patients, it might be a wash and there's likely to be equal benefit, and therefore you shouldn't be as worried about that in that scenario. Safety was similar very safe agents. We know this mechanism offers that for our patients, which is why in combo studies, I think leaving the IL-23 on board is something that patients will like mm -hmm. and makes sense from that point of view at least. So with that, dear moderator, I hand it back to you. All I'd right. Like to wrap us and okay. we can certainly spend some we're, time answering questions. We're bringing, it, we're bringing it home. All right. So hopefully, you know, we've um, left you with these smart goals or, or, or things that we hope you've learned. Um, which is that you know these um, that IL-23 is obviously a very important pathway, um, and that's going to be part of our armamentarium in treating um, these patients. We still are trying to figure out in our own minds um, how we optimize these therapies, how we pick the right types of patients, and hopefully, you know, I think there are a couple of questions in the queue about that, and um, and then we're going to have a lot of you know a lot more choices in, in terms of these um, inhibitors in treating our patients with IBD. So um, I'm going to ask a couple of more. Actually, um, I was I was looking at my phone because one of the questions here was whether used to kinemab binds to CD64. So I found articles that lot, there are lots of different ways that you can mutate antibodies so that they won't bind to CD64. 
and I couldn't find ustekinumab on that list, but I don't know the, the answer to that question in a quick Google search up here from the stage. So we'll have to get back to you on that. Um, I think there, you know, there are a couple. Uh, there, you know, um, David mentioned that um, these these drugs are safe, right? Uh, but there's one uh, person who puts in here that this must be someone who's got a skewed patient population, that they've had three patients with common variable immunodeficiency where used to kinemab didn't look so safe. So I think it just acknowledges that people who have immunodeficiency syndromes, if you kick the chair out you know, from their immune system in any way, you might really upset the apple cart. But for all intents and purposes, I think that I can't remember a patient that I thought, wow, this must be the use to kinemab is immunosuppressing them. And of course, I don't feel like we have enough, I don't have enough experience yet with RISA to tell you otherwise. So I don't know if you Do they tell you what their adverse events were? It, significant infection, sepsis. Um, have you seen infections in USTA treated patients on chemo? You know, uh, I guess that's, a, that's kind of an interesting thing. I mean, um, yeah. uh, Jordan Axelrod and others have been interested in studying people have, who have cancer and they have IBD, and what do, what do we know if we continue their, their biologic agents? And so um, I'm wondering, um, Jessica, what do you do? I mean, people, you know, the population is getting older that we're caring yeah. for, they're gonna have cancer. Yeah, so I, I think that a little bit depends on what type of cancer that they have and what they're gonna be treated with, and also which biologic you're currently using. I think all of those variables do come into play. Um, you know, liquid tumors, lymphomas, um, I think the, the need to get off of the current biologic agent may be higher. I've had a lot of patients though more recently, I shouldn't say a lot, um, but uh, breast cancer, I think, is, is coming up quite a bit. Um, and I've had a, several patients on anti-TNFs then undergoing hormonal therapy for breast cancer. And I think we work really closely with the oncology team. And, and several of those patients, we actually didn't stop the anti-TNF and they did quite well. Um, I think this is actually coming up quite a bit actually with the JAK inhibitors as well. I've had a few patients either with a remote or recent history of a solid organ tumor. And there's been questions about what do we do with the JAKs? Is it safe in that population? Um, and so I think that for me, I think a lot depends on the cancer, what they're being treated with, um, and really how bad their IBD is too, right? I mean, you really do have to manage both. Um, and so... Have you used IL-23 inhibitors for immune checkpoint colitis? I have not. I was gonna I say, not. I don't think I have. I really had to just rack my brain um, there. I've used anti-TNF, yep. of course, and, and, and Vito, of course. Yeah. I've even used Vito prophylactically in yeah. anticipation of it in some higher risk patients. I just had my first patient who needed, and we put him on a JAK inhibitor for mm -hmm. his immune colitis oh, yeah. um, and responded in two days. Yeah. You know, quite strong, uh, impressive. But I did it with, in that case with the oncologist because yeah. these things are getting complex. And so talking about chemo, I agree completely. Yeah. You know, what is the treatment we're talking about? That's right. What about, um, in what situation might you go directly to an IL-23 inhibitor? Let's talk about... Are there examples in Crohn's disease? When, when are you going to an IL-23 inhibitor? First line, you mean? Let's do first line. Yeah, so I think I always, I feel like I always have Marla in my head a little bit about if the patient has earned an anti-TNF or not, how sick they are, how severe their disease is, what extra intestinal manifestations they may have. And so I think for a patient who has inflammatory disease, who doesn't have, you know, I think with psoriasis being the exception, you know, significant extra intestinal manifestations and who hasn't really earned, you know, infliximab yet. I think IL-23 is my preferred first line agent actually in Crohn's disease right now. Um, one, given its safety profile, you know, very, very good efficacy rates. And again, two, um, thinking about what happens to patients post anti-TNF, really trying to reserve that um, for later in the treatment course if I can. If they've got very severe disease, bad perianal disease, um, then still infliximab would be my first choice in that population. My, the obvious one for me is someone who has coexistent plaque psoriasis, as a for, to use this as a first Perfect. line, but I'll also give out the pearl if they have a history of atopic dermatitis or eczema, I'll use that as a clue. Now, it's nice to have that and say, ah, I know exactly what drug I want to use for you because of this history. It doesn't always work that way, um, but it's where I would start for sure. Yeah. Whether you want to use uh, IL-23 inhibitor as your first line agent in general, 
with Crohn's disease, uh, absent perianal disease or penetrating complications, I think is an interesting and important question because you've got both the efficacy and safety there that looks quite nice, and it's often an easy nar narrative to tell a patient and to get them going on therapy, and I certainly have done that. Right. Mm -hmm. Second line, I, this is my preferred treatment after TNF, mm -hmm. uh, and certainly post-op, I'm keen on this in that scenario for yeah. some patients. I think the other aspect that we know less about right now um, is the durability, right? Because I started by mentioning that patients are kind of on an emotional roller coaster that they're gonna lose efficacy of a drug. And my sense, um, I mean, and sort of the interpretation from some of the longer term used to kinemab studies is that this mechanism seems to have longevity once people do respond to that. We'll, and we'll, we'll begin to see whether that's also true with the IL-23 inhibitors. You know, these are all one year studies. Well, we, we saw that experimentally in the randomized responders who get placebo, right? You look out at, at week 48 or 52, and although that's a, a somewhat artificial denominator, you do see that some patients that carries through for them yeah. off therapy. Right, right. Not that I encourage that. But now we're, now we're thinking about the in four and five years. And what about an ulcerative colitis? Is there an IL-23 first line? Or, or should I ask you what, in general, a biologic, your biologic, your first line biologic? Yeah, I think that I where to position this mechanism, you know, in ulcerative colitis. I think for myself, I'm still sorting out a bit. I think again, concurrent plaque psoriasis and things that sort of make it obvious to use this mechanism. But I think for me, uh, you know, betalizumab still remains the first line agent that I'm using in ulcerative colitis. I think when you look at the data though and the excellent safety profile, you could argue that these would be very reasonable first line agents. I think that the safety story and sort of the you know, like the grassroots movement around veto and how patients really, you know, I think that that is hard to unseat. And so I think for me, that still remains my first line. But I do think that these agents, again, for me, I sort of delineate, have you earned infliximab because you have very severe pancolitis, you've been hospitalized, et cetera. Um, so if, you're, if you haven't, um, then I think vetalizumab or an anti-IL-23, uh, you know, I think are very reasonable first-line choices. I'm using more S1Ps or as first-line oh, yeah. in the moderate population, yeah. to be fair. And we all know who those are when you see their scopes and know what For they're sure. doing. Um, and then I jump to Vito, and I think that it works after S1P, so I'm comfortable with that currently. I think ustekinumab still has a role in ulcerative colitis, and as much as we have good data for mirakizumab, I don't have real-world experience with that yet. Same. <laughs> Excuse me. Well, on <laughs> that. Uh, sneeze, yeah, I'm exactly. Sorry. Well, listen, <laughs> you guys have been. I tried to protect you. You guys have been an awesome <laughs> audience because, unbelievably, we've had very low attrition. This is like hopefully a harbinger of good things. It's a maintenance. <laughs> we've been able to maintain remission and have you stay, stay for the entire for the entire session. We even had an increase in responders because we had more people come in over. The delayed response. Yeah. Yeah. There was a delayed just response. Just, just hang on. You just hang on. Delayed responders are just as sustained as those who are early. The the words, of said. words of the Lord. We're such nerds. Oh, All right. right. There's one more slide. Here you go. Additional resources. You can check out the QR code as yeah. you walk to the next. And if you want those videos, videos, those little <laughs> videos, if you want to be cool with your GI fellows or, or whoever you're trying to impress on a on a first date. All right, guys. Thank you so much for being a great audience. Okay, we'll see you. We'll see you around the conference. What a first date.